you know, Peter Jennings, yourself, and, and having the opportunity to work with, um, with really smart people that I really respect is something that I've been really enjoying and something I didn't get in my old job. Not, not that my former business partners um, were not very smart people. They are, but it's, it's very different. It's a, it's a different experience. Hello, and welcome to episode 359 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, and today we are joined by a very, very special guest. You all know him as an old friend of the show. I believe this is his third or fourth time on the show. You know him as the guy who got screwed out of a million dollars in the inaugural DraftKings Sports Betting Championship a few years ago. I know him as the world's best golf better. He recently launched his own betting analytics site on Embedded.com, and now, now, part of the newly launched golf team here at ETR. It is, of course, professional sports better. Rufus Peabody. Rufus, how's it going? Let's go. On today's show, we are going to talk through golf and how to predict what will happen out there inside the ropes each week. Before we get into that, I wanted to let everyone know that this show is brought to you by the newly launched ETR golf product. Um, you know, we've been really, really hesitant to launch any new sports beyond NFL and NBA because, frankly, it's hard, right? Like, it's just really hard to provide value, to provide information that people actually need to win. But once we were able to work with Rufus on this project and leverage his data, his projections for DFS, it was just a no-brainer to launch it. Our product, which you can find on the site right now for purchase, and we'll be ready for the Masters next week, our product will have Rufus's mean projection for each golfer, ceiling projection, and odds to make cut. We'll have our ownership projections as well as a show featuring myself and Peter Jennings, CSU Ram 88, of course. And then Rufus will be on the show as well when he can jump on. We are running a launch sale right now, so head to establishrun.com and the golf subscribe page to check it out. First run of projections for the Masters will be up early Wednesday morning ahead of the Thursday morning tee off. All right. Rufus, we have a lot to get to here. I, I want to start here. I how did you get into golf? Because I know you were doing some baseball. I, I know you did the football stuff with the Massey Peabody. We talked about all that on previous podcasts. I don't think we ever talked about exactly how you ran into becoming, I guess, a golf specialist. I don't know if you'd call yourself that these days or not. You know, I, I would call myself a golf specialist now because these days it's just hard to do. It's hard to do like four sports to the level you need to, to, uh, to make money, basically, mm -hmm. to, to win at betting. You know, getting seventy five percent of the way there, ninety percent of the way there isn't enough. It's it's the one area where like you know you. I was talking to Matt David Al about this actually before, and he was like, you know, I can't really take more time off during the actual football season because you know if I'm doing ninety percent of the work, I'm losing money. Rather, you know, so, um, so I yeah, in a way, I've become a golf specialist. I'm I'm focusing much more of my energies on golf um, than anything else because it has been something that's been extremely lucrative to me over the years. And I think it's where I have my biggest edge. Um, how did I get started? Uh, you're correct that I started with baseball. When I started working for this betting group back in 2009, um, I remember uh, Train, who was um, one of one of my partners, um, talking about golf and, and saying he, he had this data that he bought. And you know, he was, he was betting some stuff, some rather simple things, basically. I mean, you know, he had essentially power ratings for golfers and was able to see that, you know, two golfers that, you know, were about the same or one guy's a little bit better than the other guy, but um, they're playing a course like Quail Hollow, which favors long hitters and the market didn't realize that. So he didn't mm -hmm. know what the true price was, but he knew there was value there on that matchup. So um, he gave me the data and I kind of ran with it. I started, you know, I built, um, I built a better projection system, um, you know, and would, I mean, we'll get into that later, but um, ran simulations and, and it kind of went from there. So basically it started, I think, like August of 2009. So it's, it's been a long time. It's been a long time, Adam. Yeah. I, I mean, one thing that I think about golf is like, I mean, it's part of the exhaustion of NFL and NBA is tracking all of the rotation changes, all of the injuries, everything that's going on and everything is so interconnected, you know, like if Joel Embiid is out, we need an entire new projection set with golf. Not only is things not as correlated, and we can talk about that more in a little bit, but also like you don't have to track injuries as hard. And we're going to talk about injuries too, and there are some, but it's not the same level as like intensity. And I feel like it's more of like a data game than it is a 
feel game. So to me, like if you're trying to live your life and I know Rufus, you're trying to like actually live your life now, betting golf is like, seems to me like way less, way less intense than trying to bet football or basketball or baseball or something that's every day. You know what I mean? Yes and no. I, I agree with that. And, and injuries are not as big a part of the game just because the, that information just really isn't out there uh, for yeah. the most part. You don't know if someone's hamstring is bothering them, although I don't know why your hamstring would be bothering you. Um, if, if you have a hamstring injury, you're probably not a very good golfer. But the thing with golf is that it is year round. When you include like the European tour, there's mm-hmm. about three weeks off in late December other than that, it's every single week. You know, I have my, you know, I run my numbers every single week, like every Monday, um, running the simulations and betting. And so it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a grind. Um, there, there's, there's no let up. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you've been doing this golf thing a long time. Do you have any good, uh, stories from golf? I know when we ask for stories from gambling, people always talk about bad beats. I'm curious if you have any, any good memories of betting golf that might be a memorable story. Um, I mean, I have a lot of bad beats for sure that I can <laughs> that I can talk about. I'm trying to think of um, of the good breaks. I, I actually remember back in I think it was 2014, 2013 or 2014. Um, it was the Masters. I think it was either Zach Johnson or Phil, Phil Mickelson got assessed some two stroke penalty for it was on 13. They like something with a bad drop or, or I don't remember what it was. I don't remember if they got disqualified or not, but I remember it ended up flipping. Like I won all these matchups as a result of it. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, that's not a very good story, but yeah. I'm just trying to think of like, <laughs> it, you don't remember the the lucky yeah. breaks as much as you, uh, as you remember the bad beats. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. And it, think about golf is like the, where you get the big payoffs is on the outrights. And my God, I mean, it's obviously hard to hit a 50 to one or 70 to one, but I'm sure, there's some of those that are definitely uh, in the bag as well with the big payoffs with the well, outrights. And Adam, a 50 to one is actually kind of a, I mean, that, that, that's kind of, I, I would say that's a favorite to mid price for, yeah. for a golf tournament because you have 144 guys on a typical week out there. I mean, if everybody was the same quality, you know, what, they'd all be 143 to one. So sure. like you have guys that legitimately are teeing off with like their actual true chances of winning. You're like one in 8,000. Um, but, you know, there'll, there'll be maybe 10 guys at 50 to 1 or better in a given week. So basically any, even if you hit the favorite, it's still what? I mean, the favorites normally are 9 to 1, 10 to 1. Yeah. Um, we've been a little higher with Ron lately. Um, okay. I, I want to get into how Rufus is doing this. And we're, obviously, we're not going to go too deep. Rufus is not going to punt off his millions of dollars of edge here. But I, I think it's interesting that you are using a simulation-based approach to do this. What can you say about sims how you're doing it why you do it this way and how that feeds into kind of dfs projections so sims i think i don't think sims are the special sauce sims are the way of of turning your projections into um into a number that you can compare against markets and compare in in a way of pricing out um for dfs as well and so um without without a simulation um it's just gonna be very difficult i mean how are you gonna uh, I mean, make cut, you know, win tournament. Those those types of things are not really easy easy to to. I mean, I think it's the only real way to do it. And you mm-hmm. need, unfortunately, a gazillion simulations to know how often the guy that actually has a one in eight thousand chance of winning is going to win. Right. But um, I think the magic is more with the projections. Um, and and there's a lot that goes into that. And and I don't know. I don't know where you want me to start, Adam. Well, I, I, I just want to make the point, too, that like uh, you probably don't know because you don't follow DFS that closely, but like the buzzword in all of DFS now is Sims. Sims. Everybody thinks mm-hmm. that Sims are like the magic uh, bullet to win in DFS. And my whole thing is like maybe that's true, but without what's going into the Sims, without the right projection that's going to the Sims, I mean, you're just going to get absolutely torched. And so maybe you can explain a little bit more about exactly what a Sim is and, and how you can get into trouble if you have bad numbers going into the Sim. Yeah, Sims. I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out. So um, I'm generally simulating at the round level. I have a projection for a golfer, although with DFS, I actually do do some whole individual whole related stuff. Um, I have a distribution for a golfer. I know, um, uh, you know, I have a mean projection and I know what that, that sort of distribution looks like, how, you know, how often he's going to shoot even par, one over par, et cetera. And so you're just sampling from a distribution. But the other thing you need to do is account for, um, account for the dynamic uncertainty in a golfer's skill. So a golfer that you anticipate being really, really bad and he plays a, a good round, you know, uh, 
you're going to update your power ranking on them a little bit. So you have to account for that in the simulations as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few other things you have to really account for as well. So think about a guy that's at the top of the leaderboard after the first two rounds. He's going to be teeing off in the afternoon on Saturday with the leaders. Um, later tee time, probably going to face more wind. You know, there's things like that that you have to account for too. So that'll, you know, although he overperformed to be in the lead, uh, you have some things that'll sort of uh, hurt his projection because, you know, you'd much rather go off at 8 a.m. than 3 p.m. in general. You're going to have a course with nobody's, nobody's been walking all over the greens, um, especially if it's like a POA, green, Poa greens, um, which, you know, we're not facing this time of year. That's West Coast swing. But um, but late afternoon is is much worse to put on. And so you, basically you have to factor in all these sort of little things to just – it doesn't – I guess it does get you ahead a little bit, but but just you're just trying to model the reality of what the mm -hmm. golfers are going to be facing each round in, in a way that I would be doing it when I'm projecting that round, like when I get there. So, right, um, yeah, and, and through this, Rufus can generate numbers for odds to win, odds top five, top twenty, top European, all this generate you know all the numbers just by running the yeah. sims and and that's going to flow down to the dfs stuff yeah adam i have like 200 i'll have two hundred thousand different like tournament sets of tournament results and so i can literally look up like oh how did this guy do you know in this round against this guy or, you, mm -hmm. you can you can price out basically anything as a result oh i know i'm interrupting the video wow but if you're enjoying this video and want to see more fantasy football and dfs content like it please just take two seconds hit the subscribe button hit the thumbs up button really does go a long way for us and we'd appreciate it. Thank you for watching and now back to the show. You, you mentioned garbage in, garbage out. I think one of the hard things about golf is knowing when guys are hurt. And I'm curious how you implement this into the Sims because we know there's certain guys playing through injuries. I mean, Hideki Matsuyama is very clearly playing through an injury which you're from the players. Bryson has talked about he might eventually need hand surgery. He's playing this week still. I feel like we always see Jason Day like hobbling around out there oh, and God. stuff. How can you, um, a data king, uh, bake some of this stuff in? Or do you just kind of let the chips fall where they may? It's it's tough. I mean, with Jason Day, I think if you're betting on him, you have to consider there's probably a 3% chance he withdraws from any given tournament due to... Well, you, you could put that into the sim, right? If you really you think could. it's 3%, yeah. you could, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, the thing is, it's about having a framework to quantify these things. And the problem with injuries is that you have a... Like, it's a game of imperfect information. And even if I knew someone like, like I know Bryson has this hand injury, broken, whatever bone on mm -hmm. his left hand, which clearly is affecting, uh, affecting him. But I don't know. I don't see when guys have injury. Most of the time you don't see when guys have injuries. So, so I can't say, Oh, like, you know, a wrist is worth three tenths of a stroke per round or something like that. But I think what you can do is evaluate um, for example, with Bryson, how he played last week at the match play, how much he lost off the tee, because I think he, you know, he did lose strokes off the tee, um, which he normally does not do uh, last week in his match play ma uh, matches and sort of say, OK, if if it affected him this much on distance, um, this much on accuracy, um, if we if that persists, this is going to hurt him x amount of strokes per round um, most of the time you know there's also going to be a lot of variance too he probably he could have just played poorly as well right. um, but the other thing you can do is is and this is more for like let's say when bryson comes back from injury um if he has surgery you know when he's clearly back you know de-weight rounds when a guy is injured now that that's that's the kind of thing or, or and it's not just injury there like if a guy has made changes to his game like bryson um Bryson at the restart uh, back in from the pandemic back in 2020 um, had put on all that weight yeah. and and he was the talk of the golf world because he was hitting the ball like you know 340 yards per drive or something and which he hadn't been doing before and so um, what I did there was I sort of deweighted some of his previous off the tee metrics um, in past rounds just because I was like, this is certainly a paradigm shift for him. I'm not going to change how I value him in other areas as much. Although then you can get into the fact that like, okay, before he was hitting longer approaches, he's hitting shorter approaches now. And the fact is his wedge game isn't as, like, 
is in the strong. So, you know, it might actually hurt him there, but, but there's all, there's sort of frameworks you can use there to analyze it based on, um, or that I use based on just having that past data and just how I weight things. Yeah. And, and for the DFS purposes, we're going to try to put a uh, mark on the projections next to guys who we think might be dealing with something. So like this week, we would have marked Hideki. We would have marked Bryson. I don't think we would have marked Jason Day because it just seems like it's always something with him, I guess. But yeah, we would have marked Bryson and Hideki for sure. I think you can just hard code that in for Jason Day. For a <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The, the other dangerous third part to me uh, with this is like, we don't know when Bryson's feeling better, right? So we could be docking Bryson projection, docking him, docking, docking. Him. Maybe he feels 100% in a couple of weeks and we have no idea and we're still docking him, you know? And so you can run into dangers that way uh, as well. So it's really tricky with injury stuff. Yeah. There's Cor- a huge outcome bias for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, correlation in golf. So we talk about correlation so much when we're playing DFS in football. We talk about it a little bit in basketball as well. I don't think anybody really puts too much thought into correlation in their DFS golf lineups, except when there's a really clear weather wave. Now, it's sometimes not as clear as it seems. You saw at the players, if the tournament gets like postponed, all bets are off, right? We don't know who's going to get the good weather at that point. It's only if like the wind is really strong at one point on Thursday or Friday, we might be able to do some that. How do you handle in your projections, correlation, or any type of weather stuff? Well, so so I, I handle weather stuff. I have, I you know, based on weather forecasts, I have the this is all automated, but it, but it, I, I know the average temperature, the guy's going to be facing the average wind speed and, you know, the probability of rain. And, and by the way, rain, rain and thunderstorms are the, the, the tricky thing because yeah. you know, the potential to stop play, especially in the U S and Europe, they'll play through anything. But, <laughs> um, but so, so I, I integrate that into my projections and when I say in, in, in the simulations, but I think you brought up a good point. It, it isn't just that one, it isn't just when one side of the draw has a clear advantage. And by the way, there are also parts of the draw. It's not like you just have morning and afternoon. There's guy, there, there's a you know generally two hour window that guys are teeing off, and so a guy that's at seven a.m. could you know face different conditions at nine a.m. But it's mm-hmm. not just that. It's it's um, it's the fact is we don't know. These are weather forecasts, and even on Wednesday, we don't really know for sure how it's going to play out. And the players was a great example, and so. There's definitely going to be a large degree of correlation um, between um, or within a within similar tee times, um, guys that'll face the same weather. And so, you know, even I mean, I would say that there's times when you'd be it could work out um, rostering a bunch of guys that maybe are in the side of the draw that looks like it's going to have a slight disadvantage. But if everybody else is going, if everybody just because there's enough uncertainty in the weather, if what if the front that's supposed to come through doesn't materialize, suddenly mm-hmm. you're facing completely different conditions than you expect. And I think there's also differences geographically in terms of how accurate these weather forecasts can be and which forecasts you should use. So it's going to be very different in Scott, like a Lynx course in Scotland or Ireland, where the weather can change very quickly. A marine forecast is what you, you know you need, like surfing websites are the best for stuff like that um, versus, you know, a tournament in Boston or, you know, Phoenix or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there, there, there's a, there's certainly a lot of nuance there, but, but I think the big thing is, and I, I think this is well established that there is certainly a lot of correlation um, it, within T within sort of the T time groupings. I don't think about any other correlation when I'm playing DFS golf, should I be thinking about guys playing together, playing better guys playing together, playing worse? Is there any other correlation you can think of, uh, in that we should be thinking about for DFS? That's interesting. The guys playing together angle is interesting. I actually looked at that about a year ago after someone said, you know, someone had quoted something to me about it or, or they believed that, that it was actually impactful. Um, and I basically, I found that there had been some effects at points, but they, they weren't persistent. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are guys where there are just people hate that are annoying. Like, like if Kepka and, and Bryson were paired together or something like that, um, you know, maybe it does affect them in some way. Um, I think it's, I think you need to, I'm, I'm joking here, but, but if Patrick Reed is in a feature group and all his, all, all the, all the, unpl- all, you know, and every, everything he's doing is being closely scrutinized, you should probably dock him a little bit. <laughs> he have the to, you know, be, to cheat as, as easily. Um, yeah, the think, inside inside I, golf joke for the guys that don't know, Patrick Reed alleged allegedly has been doing some ungentlemanly things on the course. Yeah, um, throughout the course of his career and college career, but <laughs> forever. I don't know though. Um, that's allegedly. I'm not. 
who am I to judge? Sure. But uh, I, I will say that there are, you're right. There are, so there are correlations in terms of, diff, uh, of, of golfer types. So if let's say, um, let's say a course plays softer than it, than it had in previous years. And maybe people aren't, aren't, um, aren't integrating that into their projection or something like that. So meaning, meaning the ball is not going to, um, roll out as far and it's going to make the course play longer. And so if that happens, you know, your errors are correlated in a way that, that this would favor longer hitters in a way that I hadn't anticipated. And so all mm -hmm. these guys are going to be getting a bump, um, and so, like overperforming. So I, I would say, so, so there is, there's some, you can find correlation, um, in things like that as well. Yeah. Um, that, I think that makes sense. Like if you think of course, if it, it's underrated that, you know, driving distance or something is going to be the, the key stat. And then you start grouping all the guys that have the best driving distance. And if it, it turns out you're right, the driving distance is the key stat for the week. You would have all the long hitters in one lineup. I think that's at least something worth thinking about, but I don't think that's like necessarily the best no. way to think about DFS. I think we can create bigger edges and just straight up projection stuff. I think with new courses though, where we really don't have any data points. Yeah. Um, you have an idea based on the course layout, you know, here, like, I mean, like if you told me, um, you know, if you say here's a par four that measures 500 yards and then and there's another par four that measures 380 yards, I can like, I, I will be able to tell you how I expect. Um, well, I, I can model, I model whole fit based on guys attributes, just based on that. That's like mm -hmm. with no other information I can, like, and, but at the same time, there's very different, you know, there's 380 yard par fours where the bomber, you know, that are straight and guys can, Bryson can get out, get it up close to the green, you know, versus yeah. ones where, you know, like Harbor town, where you're having to hit an iron off the tee and there's absolutely no advantage to distance. So, so basically when there's unknowns uh, and people speculating, then I think, um, especially with course fit, then I think stacking based off of at, player attributes can make a lot of sense. Uh, while we're here talking about course fit and course history, there is much debate or there was much debate in DFS golf community about whether course history is actually a thing. I mean, people used to make fun of people. Oh, you only played this guy because he did well at this course the last few years. That's random. It's just like, you know, uh, playing roulette and you roll five. So, you know, red three times around the next one's going to be black or baseball. There's so much controversy over, B over BVP stats. Where do you fall on the whole controversy over course history? I mean, I didn't realize there was such a controversy. I mean, course history <laughs> clearly matters, but I think you have to look at it the right way. It's not how often this guy won or lost tournament, you know, won or got top fives or whatever. It's it's how the guy played relative to expectation, but it's not just how he played relative to expectation. It's how he played relative to expectation based on how you anticipate him fitting that particular course because you don't mm -hmm. want to double count. You don't want to say, oh, this guy, you know, he's long, you know, he's overperformed here a bunch and he's long and it fits long hitters. Um, that, you know, you'd be double counting if you hint, if you did it that way. You, and so I, I'm saying after this course fit, like whatever that residual is, like how much he over or underperformed per round, that does have some predictive power. Um, but again, you also, it's not that not every part of a golfer's game is the same in that regard. Um, you know, there's a difference between overperforming around the green, overperforming off the tee on approach. I mean, you can break it down and, and look at, and, and look at where a guy got, you know, um, really outperformed what you expected. And, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm not going to wait how much he over, uh, you know, if a guy just was like white hot on the greens, um, and gained a ton there, but, you know, that's not quite as important as being really good off the tee right. uh, relative, you know, so what, yeah, because I mean, there's more, there's more randomness in that. Like golf, like putting clearly matters in golf. It is a skill, um, but there is more randomness involved in putting than there is in being able to drive the ball 340 yards. Sure. And so, in a small sample, luck is largely going to uh, be a bigger driver than it will be in something like driving distance. Sure. And, and one thing I would say about course history before we before we wrap that up undoubtedly like the standout course history guys inflate ownership in DFS. And that's something we're going to be watching with our ownership projections. Obviously we have the algorithm going for, uh, for uh, ownership projections, but we will do manual bumps because it's so clear that people are just flocking to guys who have really good course history. And, and as Rufus said, that is based into our projection and Rufus's projection. So you don't want to double count it, I guess is my point and Rufus's point yeah. as well. Yeah, and I think people also just say, oh, this guy won, or it, it's, I mean, I'll, I'll equate it to in the NFL. It's, you know, people think the great teams, 
the best teams in the league have, you know, a big home field advantage. Like when the Saints are good, people talk about the yeah. home field advantage at the Superdome, or when the Seahawks are good, it's the home field advantage there. Where, you know, um, it's, and I think in golf, people look at how, you know, if a guy won, like yeah. that's a big thing, right? And maybe, maybe it gives him a confidence boost. Maybe there is some sort of mental benefit um, that I'm not picking up on. But to me, it's just as important if he got, you know, if he was playing really poorly coming into the tournament and I antip- anticipated him like missing the cut and he ends up finishing like 30th. That's, that's, that's solid course history. Exactly. Um, you mentioned putting, you know, I feel like this is one of the keys because like a guy can play really well and miss a couple putts or miss five putts by an inch. And it looks like he didn't play that well. Right. And so like, obviously we can strip that out and we can see it in the data, but how do you think, about putting and like I, I sometimes when I play DFS I'm like man I'll play some of these bad putters I don't know like uh Benny on or or Aaron Wise I know is your boy uh, Sergio you know guy, like guys like that who like I think are bad putters but if they can just get hot I feel like they're underpriced so I don't know maybe that's a donkey way to think about it how do you think about how do you think about putting Aaron, Aaron Wise was my guy for a while or like <laughs> uh last year after the after the well after the restart from the pandemic not as much anymore but it feels like Throughout my betting career, I bet more on bad putters than good putters, just because I think um, I think historically the market is overvalued putting. I think that's kind of um, that's corrected largely uh, now. But I mean, I think as I said before, putting there's more short term variation in putting, and so if a guy's been really hot putting, and I think this is you know I think this is a talking point, you know. I'm not the first to say this, but you know, if if a guy's putted really well recently, there's that's gonna that is gonna have less of an impact on um, on how it affects his future power rating than if he was good in some other area recently. Yeah. So, I think in a way there can be some value in fading the short term fluctuations in that. Now, you know. The thing is that what's funny is when you hear a guy was putting really poorly or a guy was putting really well, like, I mean, remember when John Rahm, John Rahm has putted poorly relative to his, uh, his career baseline the last six months or so. And mm-hmm. he changed putters and then changed back. You have things like that. You have, you, you can hear things like, oh, Morikawa changed, you know, he changed his grip on his putter or, or suddenly he's, you know, I don't know, he's putting better. Like Will Zalatoris, he, you know. If, if he ever figures out how to putt, like he's going to be the best player in the world. But you hear narratives like Zalatoris has been working on his putting. And I think people see, oh, he's putted well the last two events. He must like he's turned the corner. He's found something. Yeah. Is that actually the case or not? I mean, that's that's you know, maybe there was some fundamental change he made, but probably it's just, you know, he's it, it, it's hard for me to believe that a guy like Will Zalatoris, who's been playing golf for his whole life, probably suddenly figures out how to putt after you know it's not like he hadn't been trying beforehand (laughs) i don't mean yeah i I think sometimes these guys go to these grip changes and go to like the claw or whatever and maybe sometimes that makes a difference i'm sure you can look at that and see when they went to the claw and if it actually made a difference but yeah i mean i I, obviously two week sample size anybody who follows us in football know that like you know if the usage didn't change and it's just results based over two weeks you know that's not going to be a thing it's going to be the same in golf yeah, I think I think that's a that's a fair way of putting it. Um, I will say, betting on or on bad putters can be quite tilting. At, oh. Like when, when you see like you know 180 yards, seven feet to the hole, and then you know two putt like every hole, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask about the idea of long term form versus short term form, and, and you know I, I think that there's a lot of different theories on this. Some people like to wait short term more. I think you and I, from just knowing you, it seems like long term would be better, but can it be, can long term and short term be defined differently for different golfers? You know, like if uh, DJ had a bad few weeks, is that the same as, you know, somebody who sucks? I don't know, like Matt Neesmith or something, having a bad few weeks or something, uh, you know, is it the same? How do you think about long term versus short term? So I don't think of it as like two separate things. I, I look at, form over it's like a continuous function it's Mm -hmm. like saying this is how much i weight last week relative to the week before relative to the week before that and 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 that differs for different aspects of a of a golfer's game um and so golf more than golf does get more short-term weight relative to other sports i would say um that's just 
the way it is. Um, Adam, you don't play golf, so you wouldn't understand. Mm. But I've played, but not well. But yeah, I've played. And, and clearly a guy with, with a smaller sample, um, you know, short-term stuff is going to matter more just because there's less, we have less history to go off of. Yeah. What's interesting with that though is also, I mean, the thing is you, you have big samples for all the guys. Like I have all the amateur data for all these guys um, for, for real events they played. Although I don't, I don't think I've, I don't have, I don't have mini tour stuff, but I have, um, I, I actually manually collected some of that during the pandemic when, <laughs> when, when, when there was betting on mini tours, when that was all there was. But, yeah. Uh, the outlaw tour. Yeah, no, that's what it was. The, yeah. the outlaw tour. But, you know, figuring out how much to weight a guy's round in college versus, you know, when he's a rookie on the PGA tour versus like around there. I mean, that's kind yeah. of all part of the secret sauce. I, I guess my question is like, you might weight different time periods differently for different guys. Like, you know, DJ might uh, uh, wait the last six months, but you know, someone newer on tour, you might only wait the last three weeks or something like that. That's a, that's honestly a real challenge. It is really hard to build individualized DK functions um, yeah. just because there is so much noise. And so I, you know, uh, you know, if, if you can figure out how to do it, let me know. <laughs> well, uh, believe me, I've tried. Well, we have some spreadsheet versions. Maybe we can, we can help, but I, I somehow I doubt it if you haven't figured it out. All right. I, I want to think about a couple of DFS things before we wrap up here. And so like, it's obvious to anyone that there's a lot of randomness in golf, right? Like way more than even football. I feel like like the chances that Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes are a top five quarterback on the week in the right matchup are like really, really high, right? The chances that Giannis or Jokic or Embiid is a top scorer on an NBA DFS slate, ridiculously high. But in golf, like, okay, this week's a good example. Valero, like Rory McIlroy is the best player in the field, uh, clearly by a mile. But the chances that he even top tens, like I, I think, you know, Rufus had it like, you know, 30 something percent, low 30s or something like that. How do you think about these guys who are the favorites that are very expensive in DFS, like Rory was on this Valera slate, and he was the most owned player in the slate and projected to be most owned player on the slate up over 30 percent as well. Like, how do you think the randomness at these expensive high owned guys comes into play? Well, I think it's for the most part reflected in the pricing and then I don't play, you know, NFL DFS or anything. So I, like, but I would guess the, that there's a much greater dispersion um, in the pricing of a Josh Allen relative to a, I don't know, try to name, pick, pick your crappy quarterback. Matt Ryan. Um, yeah. Sam Darnold, someone like that. <laughs> <laughs> I see what, yeah. You're doing um, clearly. Um, I mean, there are times when when it's going to make sense to take the top guy. I mean, personally, I've been bet. I've, I've thought John Rahm's been undervalued for two years. It feels like a year and a half. Um, just he's and, and he's the best golfer in the world. Although he just got surpassed um, by Scotty Scheffler to be the world number one. But don't let that fool you, John Rahm's still the best. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I think the randomness is, a, to me, it's a feature of golf, not a bug. Yeah. I, I think in being able to understand that. And, and I think that's where the simulations come in too. I mean, because, you know, um, you could say this guy's X strokes better, but like, how does that, you know, translate? I mean, to, to put in perspective, I'll bet like John Rom to win many, many weeks, but I hardly am ever finding value on him to be top five or top 10 or top 20. So I think the market, I think I, to your point, I think that um, people, I think often don't realize how much random risk there is and how unlikely, I mean, the, the top golfer is hardly ever a favorite to be uh, top five. Yeah, I, I guess like, uh, and this is just my gut and I, I we want to work on math stuff is we're gonna keep building on the golf product. But like, I want to be able to vaunt, uh, assign like an EV probability or an EV calculation to like where does Rory need to finish at this salary and this ownership he's 11,200 he's 34 percent owned where does he need to finish to actually make him a plus EV play and my gut is that it's like he's got to finish really high like really high and so you know uh, that's like uh, my gut has always been just like try to fade the guys even though you know you know like I, we were working on this stuff behind the scenes. Rory had a massive projection at, uh, in Rufus's stuff. I was just like, man, I can't stomach the most expensive guy and have him be 34%. So I don't know. That's just one thing that I was thinking about, but we're going to keep working on that stuff and, and our spreadsheet versions will be on it. Rory wasn't like, I mean, 
he wasn't he, he he was the number one, but he wasn't number one by a huge huge margin. Not a huge uh, huge margin, but yeah, I think but I had him. Like, I think I think I I only made him like seven percent to win. So right, not. It's just that the field the field looks like I guess it was a little higher after answer with Drew, but yeah, um, yeah. There's just not a lot of top golfers playing this week, but I. Yeah, to okay. Your point, betting on picking Rory is always like I mean. Something I try to avoid just because of PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there certainly seems like there's more more variance in Rory's game than there is in someone like Rom or something like that. And I'm sure um, we can talk about that in Sean's shows and stuff as the season goes along. Oh, yeah. And variance is a hu- is going to be a huge part for DFS. Um, yeah. It's going to affect your makeup percentage, your upside, all that stuff. Although I think that – I will say I think that – a lot of people think maybe there is more variance than there is. And in terms of like, Oh, a guy had been really high variance. Like um, th- there's sort of fundamentals to predicting how high variance a guy's going to be too. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, a longer hitter all else equal will be a higher variance player than a shorter hitter. I mean, yeah. there, there, there's different sources of variance. There's the course source of variance and there's the player source. And, and the thing is, I mean, it's it's not about how much variance a guy has had in the past. It's about what he's going to have in the future. And that's something that I model. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Like we said, that's so huge for DFS. And we'll definitely be talking about that on articles and shows and stuff like that. Um, okay. I think ownership. The last thing I want to talk about uh, with um, DFS and golf is ownership because it's such a huge thing. Because, you know, I mean, I think DFS golf is a game theory game. We're talking about some of the reasons why on this show it's um predicting dfs ownership is gonna be similar to what we do nfl but it's a little bit different because i think so many people are looking at line movement in other words if if rory opens uh you know 12 to 1 to win the tournament he closes 9 to 1 the uh, the salaries on DraftKings and FanDuel are set as if uh he was at 12 to 1 and they they mirror that really closely but after the movement obviously the salaries are already locked and rufus is doing a lot of the moving of these markets so i don't think you're seeing adam to interrupt i don't think you're, you're going to see as much movement in outright odds yeah. as you will in matchup prices because right the outright markets if you think about it generally the hold like circa is the best with like a circa and pinnacle i think around 20 percent hold like a more standard is like 40 percent. that's mm-hmm. a lot of hold you yeah. i mean so there just aren't going to be as many opportunities to find profitable bets so even if a guy you know, is mispriced relative to other guys, he might not have a ton of value overall in an outright market. Yeah. Plus, these are not the types of markets. I mean, it's not a two-way market. So, I mean, you're generally not seeing, I mean, you're not seeing big moves just purely on right. on a lot of action. I mean, I'll be honest, I'll bet some, I'll bet Sebastian Munoz at like 350 to one at circuit to win a tournament and they move it to 80 to one. Right. I mean, <laughs> I didn't make him, I made him 310 to one. Like, you know, but I can't go bet against him. At, right. You know, so, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, I was using that as an example, but Rubens brings up a good point. These markets that you can't bet no on, in other words, you can't bet Munoz not to win the tournament, be very careful of. But yeah, the matchups are a good point too. You know, if Rory has a matchup with Bryson and the line starts moving, people are seeing that. And I think, I think that's moving DFS uh, uh, ownership as well. So I guess my question is how do you, th- can you, what can you say about how the golf betting market works? Because I think it really does flow down to DFS ownership. So, I mean, the betting market, I, I feel like there's a, lot, a few big drivers um, of it. I think that you, you have markets opening generally um, Monday morning. Um, I know Data Golf puts out stuff. I think that'll, that gets incorporated to, to a large extent into prices. But at this point, um, it's, I think, pinnacle bet online. I mean, some of um, you know, the, the, US, the U.S. facing books, a lot of them open on Monday. And... Mm-hmm. And and so and and the market kind of comes to this equilibrium, but at this point limits are lower. And then generally on Tuesday you have Bet Chris that comes out, and oftentimes their prices will be very different, um, and they take higher limits. And the market tends to move much more towards that. And I think um, in the in the past that's kind of driven some of the uh, that's driven some of the ownership, I believe, just the thought that the market moved pretty hard. Mm-hmm. But in reality, yeah, it was the fact that one book was willing to take. Um, bigger bets and kind of hold steady with their their price. Uh, I guess that brings up the question, do you think that those moves are sharp? In other words, do you think that the moves that happen at Chris at that point are sharp or no? I personally do, but mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, okay. And that's something that we're definitely going to keep our eye on when we're working on these ownership projections. Again, I just think it's so important. All right. Last thing 
uh, have to ask. People are going to ask Rufus, why now? Why why share info um, at all? You know, you've been uh, uh, protective of it. I think you're obviously doing really well betting the golf. Why do anything public facing uh, now and in golf? It's a good question, Adam. Um, I know I'm going to probably be getting a lot of blowback in the next few days um, about this. Um, <laughs> I'm ready for it. But um, the short answer is, I think I've been, I, I could say I've been looking for a change and looking for something different and some sort of new purpose, I guess, for the last few years. Because when you do the same thing over and over again for for a long time, it gets kind of, you know, it gets kind of, I don't want to say boring, but, you know, it, yeah, like, I, I want to challenge myself. I want new challenges. And I mean, that's a big part of, of why I, I um, launched Unabated. Um, with a fantastic team of people and it's um, and you know I feel like I've made so many great connections in the industry um, you know Peter Jennings yourself and and having the opportunity to work with um, with really smart people that I really respect is something that I've been really enjoying and something I didn't get in my old job not not that my former business partners um, were not very smart people they are but it's it's very different it's a it's a different experience and so I mean, I think that's the sort of why and like, well, well, that's the why anything and why this group of people, I mean, I really have a ton of respect for, for what you all do at, at ETR. Um, personally, you've helped me with my fantasy. And actually when I stopped last year, when I didn't look at your stuff, I got like, I literally got last place. So um, <laughs> after getting second place and having the best team the year before. So um, yeah, clearly, I mean, I, I, I listened when, it, like, I, I won't say I listened to every episode, but that's just because I don't listen to podcasts that often, but I, I I uh, listen from time to time and really enjoy it. Um, I think the other thing is with, you know, golf is golf is my bread and butter. It's the thing I care the most about. It's the thing I'm best at. Um, and, and so there's definitely risk for me in terms of, um, I guess there's reputational risk in a way because people see what I'm on and can actually judge and say, Ooh, is he actually any good? Or is this all hype? Um, but also towards to my betting, but I, I think, Part of this, like, I mean, the market incorporates a lot of information, both mine and others who bet. Um, and I'm going to be, you know, I'm putting this out on, on this will be Wednesday morning. So the market will already have had time to digest some of that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, um, and, and the other thing is, like, this isn't something I would do for, like, I, I wouldn't be selling betting picks or anything like that. Um, but I think what makes DFS very interesting is the game theory. Mm -hmm aspect to it. And I, I'm looking forward to talking about that, honestly, on, on your podcast. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'd say a couple of things, you know, as someone who's kind of always had a foot in, in both, you know, I've always been playing poker for myself or playing DFS for myself and also trying to work. There, there's something um, fulfilling about working with other people and building as part of a team that you don't get from just like going to the casino and playing poker every day, you know, where it's just, you, you don't get that. And I think, you know, obviously, if you guys follow Rufus on Twitter, he's on like a, a Buddhist uh, uh, find himself kick. And I think that's that's part of it is just like it's really individual. I mean, betting or playing poker or or playing DFS for yourself. It's a really, really individual thing. And and I think part of life is just like um, working with other people towards something bigger. And so, yeah, I, I, I felt that somewhat from Rufus. The other thing that I would say is that like we are um doing our best to protect Rufus's betting. That's why the projections will not be out until Wednesday morning. I don't think that's really a big deal for DFS. Nobody should be building golf lineups before we have weather and tee times anyways. And so you should be building on Wednesdays anyways. So the projections will be out Wednesday mornings. I want to be very clear about that before we get a bazillion questions about where the projections are for the Masters on, on Monday morning. Um, so, yeah. I also think, also, Adam, um, not to get into really boring stuff, but the tax consequences for building a company are, you know, it's much, it's much better tax wise than, <laughs> than ordinary income, which is what you get yes. from betting. So, I mean, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping to grow unabated. It's something I'm, I'm really, really enjoying. And yeah. Well, let me, let me stop you there. I don't think a lot of people probably know what unabated is. I've been using unabated, their prop tool. When we've been doing the props, we run, they run, you can put in projection and run a simulation and it'll tell you exactly what price you can bet stuff. Too. In other words, if we have Tyreek Hill for 79.5 yards, the line is 85.5. You can put that in and it'll tell you exactly what you can bet it to. I think that's a really valuable tool that they have. Also, the odd screen on Unabated um, is one of the best I've seen in terms of how fast 
it is and being able to compare lines and shop. And as someone who has money on, I don't know, 15 different books in Colorado, like even if I'm just sitting around, I just want to bet a game. I, I just like, I, it's not in me to take the worst price. So like I go to the odd screen, I find the best price and, and I go bet it there. And it's just an absolute no brainer. So we do have a link to Unabated in the description below. Highly recommend you check it out. Rufus, do you want to say anything else about what's going on in Unabated? Well, I wanted to ask if you've used any of the trading tools on the odd screen that integrate to be able to figure out is minus two and a half minus 105 a better price than minus three plus 105. Yeah, I, I haven't because I haven't really, I was just started poking around after football. So it's much clearer. I feel like in, in NBA, the lines are a bit more uniform, but yeah, I hear you for football. Like you can find three flat versus you know, uh, three and a half minus 140s all the time. And it's hard to know what's better. Well, we also have, so we have live lines and which include, we have a feed, a live feed for deck prism, which is the sharpest, um, in my opinion, um, source for live odds out mm-hmm. there. Um, they, they do B2B, but, uh, but we have the live trading tools for college basketball and we're going to be launching that for NBA um, next week, I believe. And so you can actually say, well, what's the probability based on, based on this one book's number, what's the probability the game goes to overtime? What are all these alternate lines? You know, what's minus 12 and a half, what's minus two and a half, what's everything in between there yeah. um, to just be able to pick off some, some, derivatives that just are not priced correctly because honestly like doing like it's 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 not as easy for the sports books to do live um when you're having to react dynamically to things so. yeah oh yeah if you're willing to sit there and grind live i i think that that is where the biggest edge in sports betting probably is right now in terms of major more major markets obviously i think the biggest edge is in props and anybody who's been following our props understands why but yeah i think i, I think the live stuff is in terms of more liquidity i think there's more liquidity in the live market than there is in props i hope there is although i haven't really ducked my my toes into the live streets too much. Um, go ahead. I was going to say though, I mean, I'm so bad at giving the unabated elevator pitch. I think I need, <laughs> like, I need something. I, I, I need to just press play on something because every time, like I would forget to say something or I just, you know, I go off on tangents, Adam. Um, yeah. That's what I do. And so, yeah. You can also listen to the roofers go off on tangents on bet the process. I listen to every episode of that and, and th- that is uh tangent central. It's the best part. You know, I'm uh, about to be recording it after this with, uh, we have Scott Fawcett on the founder of the decade app. To, we're going to talk, it's going to be a, it's going to be a golf centric bet the process this week. Oh, baby. Well, it is Masters Week after all. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're serious about betting, I, I do really recommend checking out Unabated. Again, they are running a sale right now. If you click on the link in the description, it will take you there. All right. Rufus, really appreciate the time. I'm so excited to get started on golf. You're going to be on the show next week with me and Peter, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, you, you guys, we're going to talk Masters with Rufus, me, Rufus, and Peter next week. And we will be launching the projections Wednesday morning. Head to stopattorun.com as we speak right now. The subscribe page is up. Pricing and everything is on the site. Check it out there. I will see you in the DFS golf streets. For Rufus, for Bruce Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.